And to set the agenda and approve the consent. No, we'll be second. Okay. Does anyone wish to pull anything from the consent? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. That passes. Uh, next item is a chair report. I really don't have anything other than I won't be at the board meeting this month. I'll be traveling. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a number of just verbal updates, things we've been working upon internally. Um, the first is to let you know that Donna and I traveled to Las Vegas last week to meet with City Manager Josh Panero and uh, Mayor Giannis, who serves on the board. Um, we did that because I'm new in this chair uh, and had not yet met with, with the mayor. And we also are acknowledging that there have been uh, an uptick in opt-outs in Spanish, and we're trying to figure out what's been going on with that. There's no, no one source, uh, just a lot of chatter online and next door, social media, things like that. And so we went um, with the intention of talking with them about all the different things that are going on. We prepared an economic impact report. Um, happy to report that Nestle Clean Energy has provided nearly $2 million since their launch with us, uh, both in customer savings and support around uh, government, the PP, and other things. Um, it was an excellent meeting. I do want to thank you, Donna, for coming. And it was um, a reminder why it matters to sit down and have a face to face meeting and answer questions and clarify um, how things are working and the fact that um, their customers now have a significant discount, et cetera. So uh, I will say that the mayor provided some very uh, positive comments at the end of the council meeting that same night uh, and apparently received over 70 um, hits on his social media. And so I think we're on the way to come there. Yeah, frankly, just filling in some informational gaps that have existed, we have a very clear feedback that we need to work on uh, kind of segmented, targeted communication in that community so that everybody understands how this works, what's going on, and what the benefits are. So just, I don't know if you want to add to that, Donna, but it was a good um, meeting. Yeah, I thought it was a really, really good meeting. Um, their view uh City manager uh, Josh is in focused on just um, really improving the committee and I mean the city and and he's so passionate about it. I, I was so impressed uh, by their level of um, investment into their infrastructure system, um, their partnership with their school district, and they're just you know Las Vegas was open for business kind of attitude like. You know, and, Very and, much so. and I think we can help them in other ways than just PCE. Um, you know, some of our connections in Silicon Valley might be important relationships to help them develop for um, housing, commuting, transit, and all kind of tie into sustainability and energy and, and things like that. So um, overall, I'm just saying I'm incredibly impressed with the two of them and their um, 
just utter passion and dedication to a community that is 50% care and care customers. You know, it is very high. And, you know, they characterize their customer base by, you know, if you're either you're waking up in the morning at six, getting your kids out the door, leaving at seven, leaving two hours, coming back, you're getting home at eight. Um, weekends are filled with a lot of you know kids or just you know household errands. Um, and you know even if you're making above that hundred thousand dollars, it's still um, it, you know the cost of community, the cost of um, housing, and everything is still so it's you know I mean it's it's a it's it's a it's just a it's a community that's going to struggle with a lot of um, things that we're struggling with here in the Bay Area. So I, I just am so proud of us to be a part of that and affiliated with them. I think it's just a really important city for us to really work with and be part of it. I was going to say there's more to come. There's more for sure. They, they are so, um, this is how we're going to bridge the gap in sustainability and some of the things with the coasts and the Central Valley is these kind of ships and they're gonna be portable to California if they think it's um, reduction by by linking together with these communities. And I think we'll be able to set a model example of how the coasts can work with the Central Valley and take our maybe ideological differences, but coalesce of the shift. Yeah. Agreed. Well said. I think that they're very focused on their relationship with the school district. You yeah. said that. Are they very focused on their relationship with PCE? They are. I think they are now. They are now. Yeah, it was yeah. in that way. I think. We we hit the target that we were after mm -hmm. and set, I think, a very positive relationship going forward. Yeah. And there's more to come. Yeah. We asked about meeting quarterly. Um, the, the city manager declined to kind of get into a that kind of formal structure, but I think there will be regular communication and we'll go back on a regular basis. Yeah, and he invited us, uh, Josh and Paul both invited anyone who happens to be driving through that way. If you're going to set, if you're going to Yosemite, if you're, you know, even heading down to, uh, you know, House of Robles or somewhere like that area down to the coast, it's really about a 45 minute, you know, inland jaunt. And it's a beautiful, beautiful drive and a beautiful city. And they invited any of us to come out. They would be happy to give us, you know, a tour and introduce us to the community and show us a little bit about what kind of makes them tick. But yes, I think they really understood Rick, the value that we're adding to their community and how deaths and you know <laughs> extraordinarily burdensome for people and they don't realize it. So that communication. And messaging has to be fixed, and that the leadership has to take the lead the way. And I think they heard that too. Julia, then Marty. Thanks. I was just wondering, we had a an, an update um, with about the survey last board meeting, the survey that, that was taken. And I was curious if any of the the issues that came up um, from that survey were part of maybe why they were opting out. Like they thought it was more expensive, you know, those types of things that we had heard. Is that kind of a thing we're saying? Yes. It's it's a couple of things. Um, and this happens actually in multiple communities. So PC is not unique um, in sort of having moments of spikes of opt-outs. Um, some of it is just related to the fact that they don't believe they're getting a discount. And part of that is just a function of seasonal rates. So in the winter, rates are super high because gas prices go up. It doesn't matter if you're a PCE or another CCA, you will generally see a natural uptick in opt-outs. And then the second is we're in the middle of the summer um, which so electric rates sort of gone up because they're they're using more electricity. And then the other thing that that we're finding is that in their responses back, because um, we do track opt out responses, there are some who just are not interested in a, a government run um, mm -hmm. agency and don't like being opted in, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's the bad across the state. Okay. So um, what we really did focus on was. Um, just the economic opportunity for the customer and the community in being our partner, as opposed to lots and lots of focus on GHG reduction. They're all, they're both true, it's a both thing. Right, yes. Yes, I think perhaps uh, this is an opportunity for the board to take a trip and take a look at the, our solar energy uh, building mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. we, we went to the groundbreaking. 
but we never went back. I believe it's it's kind of an operation. So yes. So uh, it's a great idea. I think you should. I mean, okay. even I. Me too. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. I, I think that's exactly right. I think we could. We, we need to have a launch party at mm -hmm. the right facility. We never did that, and we can separately set up a meeting with them and be obvious, easy way to do it when we're there. Mm -hmm. um, and the school district too, because they really are very clear that they want to cultivate that partnership right. to leverage um, financial investment in community facilities. And we can play a part in that mm -hmm. um, where the energy piece is concerned. So we're happy to add that to our list. Right, they can even have a by birthday, have a field trip for the students to go out to the facility and kind of. Mm -hmm. We have to work with the owner on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're right, buddy. We're sort of here with our schools, you know, to educate our children about sustainability and all the work we're doing on clean energy in our schools. And obviously, be transferred. And Kristen was down there, I think, for the day working she with them. She went down to work with schools for the day and, um, you know, um, I mean, they are just really, um, it's an amazing little, very dynamic and, um, you know, really inspiring community. So, um, look all right. First of all, great idea. Um, I, mean, I was just going to sort of add to that. We could somehow organize some sort of a soccer match between the kids. <laughs> and everybody wears a PCE jersey. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, uh, just an idea. Yeah. Um, the second thing is uh, what is their opt in rate? And you said there's some opt out recently, uh, some statistical. Yeah, you know, I don't know if Leslie is on this call. I don't have that offhand. I know there's been a spike over the last three weeks. I talked to Leslie and she said there it was 88%. So 88% opt out. <clears throat> yeah. And that's that's a significant increase. <laughs> on average, you know, it's 15 to 20 a week. We've seen it jump to about 35. So we're at that level of minutia, but that is an indicator. In that in the Las Vegas area. But when you compound that over time, and then unfortunately, the way the law is written, they have to stay out for a year. So they can't actually come back to our service for a year. So it was it became imperative for us to have that meeting and, and there will be more, but I think a field trip's a great idea. Okay. Was there a lot of discussion about our race? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's yep, we talked about the discount and the the current discount for the majority of Las Vegas customers because of the PCIA and the vintaging, we're up over nine percent right now. Mm -hmm. And but that message had not pierced yeah. the veil at all. <laughs> and they're not feeling it or seeing it on the customer bill. And so there was just, you know. I think it was a word of mouth of misinformation campaign that has happened in the past to other CCAs. So we're, we're also learning from that. And um, so we cleared that up and the, and the mayor did clear that up in his remarks that very night, which was great. So um, we've also had requests from a couple of the news outlets down there who've reached out subsequently. And so we will be following up on interviews with their editorial boards and all that. Carlos. Yeah, I was just going to say that, just comparing demographics, it is a radically different community yes. than the county. I mean, think of it this way. Our average income is $139,000 in the county. Their average is $68,000. Yeah. Their average age limit per family is 29. Ours is 40. Yeah. That 10-year difference is half a generation. Yeah. Right? Compared to, you know, um, also coupled with you know, the whole issue of, 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 of income. And it's also 71% Latino. Yes, it is. That number blew me away. I mean, I would, I would like to know who's, who is opting out, whether it is, you know, segmented by age, age whether it's segmented by race. I mean, are, are we communicating in the right language? Are we, you know, maybe it's folks who feel like 
<clears throat> you know, the, the community is changing a lot. And this is one of those things that is another change that they don't want. I don't know. Um, but it's, it is radically different. I mean, I've it's actually compared these two, these two demographics. Dean, I think it's actually the community hasn't changed much. When you go through the downtown, there's boarded up buildings and things like that. So the economics of it are clearly, but I think it's more just the bills have gone up. It was a hot summer, many over 100 degree days. They were probably using electricity a lot more. Bills went up and people didn't understand, but they see it in their top to down. But there were some very negative comments from Paul oh. at the prior council meeting, yes. which got picked up. Yes. So my guess is that some of those opt outs were came out of social media I'm reaction sure to okay. the comments that were made, which yeah, is sure why the meeting was so important. That's right. And for the chair, I think some of the things that Paul was saying was also some of the things that Carlos was saying. Yeah. So, it, but it maybe in a different kind of a, a tone. So, I think those are good to be mindful as we go in, just the differences in the two communities. For mm -hmm. sure. But also, I think highlighting some of the similarities of our community. So, that we, you know, we have, you know, even my community, I'm like, you know, I'm 55% renters in my community. Um, it was like, really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And I'm like, you know, I've got two Title I schools in my, you know, school district. Um, and we really work to try to highlight the areas that we are more similar than they might have realized and understand how even where we're different, like our relationships in Silicon Valley can help them. They're going to need to raise a million dollars to build a new community pool. Mm -hmm. They're not going to raise it in their community. They're going to have to raise it where their people work, which is in Silicon Valley. So those kinds of helping them with school bonds, helping them with lots of things. We just bring a lot of talent. And I think Paul all of a sudden realizes we're really going to be a fantastic partner, not just on energy, but energy is the basis from which our communities can connect. Well, you and he was very engaged, yes, at our surplus funds meeting. Is there anything else on Las Vegas before we move on? Yeah, Colleen has I don't know if uh Naley went to Santa County the comparison. Here we'll put the cellular by law, PG and E, PCE, and ECHO 100. I don't know if we have to put ECHO 100 on there, but I think a lot of people pick that up and they look at that, they look at PG and E, and they go, oh my God, PCE is so much more expensive. And that may be part of the problem. It's unfortunately, it is required. Is there any, a product that we offer, so. any way we can characterize that a little stronger? Yeah. And this is a, a look at that. special often. Yeah, that's the joint rate mailer, which is an annual. Yeah, but we could probably fold the yeah. Eco Plus. Yeah. Well, don't forget that's going to be. We just have to have the information to the structure right. the way that we want. Yeah, correct. And I already talked to Gwen about she's a great hand for segmentation and making sure that we do better targeted communications to different populations within both of our services, you know, both areas. So the main headline here is major step in the right direction. There's more to do. And we love it. Um, I do want to say that also the procurement subcommittee, several of you are in the room, met that same morning um, to discuss resource adequacy compliance and the fact that um, we have a notified by our team that we are running, um, we anticipate to run about $30 million over budget for the fiscal year and 24 the calendar year. So they look at all the way out through 2024. 2024 compliance, especially in the third quarter, is just, it's always the toughest three months to meet. It's the pain point because it's high usage, um, but we've got year ahead, requirements and then month ahead requirements on this RA. The short um, news there, and, and please speak up, Jeff or uh, Rick, is that the procurement subcommittee validated its earlier direction that we had received uh, early this spring mm -hmm. to do our level best to meet CPUC RA requirements, irregardless of the fact that they are onerous and you know, we are acknowledge, we think it's market distortion and, and major corrections that need to happen. So um, I don't know if you two want to add in. Um, I mean, one thing to point out is this is 
probably a short term issue. In yeah. terms of the next couple of years, the RA bottleneck sort of eases and our our all our hundred percent uh, time points event policy actually helps us basically in the long run this problem goes away for us. Not entirely, almost I mean in large large parts. So it's sort of it's, it's there's a short term period, a couple of years here where we might be overpaying by uh, probably probably a couple of tens of millions of dollars, but it's a problem that does go away. And then short term, there's a there's a reputational value to, to doing what we can to comply. That was the that was sort of consensus, I think. Of, so I think. Well, the other thing is that there are CCAs that are intentionally not complying because the penalties mm -hmm. are greatly in excess of uh, the cost of buying the power today is greatly in excess by tens of millions of dollars of the penalties. So they're choosing to take the penalties and there's some consequences of taking the penalties, in particular, not being able to expand the CCA. Well, the price just looks bad. Which, yeah, so, which is quite significant for some <clears throat> CCAs, East Bay, and uh, Central Coast. and Central Coast are both attempting to expand, and they're been shut down by the PUC with that expansion because of the because they chose to incur the penalties rather than pay the excess costs. So I think when it gets presented to the board, um, that issue of what that actual cost is and what the alternatives are need to be assessed. The subcommittee decided under we should comply but there was disagreement on the subject well and sean i'm sorry if i made the chair but sean you, you sent out that so you're, you're already staff. in period fourth you go to see april because you don't even have a place and that's when you need to figure out how to solve this problem okay sorry who's that really think you should try to get like drama or something is, is that someone that's just Ooh. talking yeah, yeah. Uh, Sorry, no, I was just saying you you may have been two or three weeks ago in your um board board newsletter newsletter you actually had that article from the San Diego Union. That's right. Where it was pointing out that there were a number, including San Diego, right? It did not meet their requirements. And it just it just reads really bad. Yeah, really uh, bad. Yeah, yeah, and and it you know it's like oh these folks are so incompetent even though it's really hard it's really expensive to, to get the RA but, but, and, but and it, it doesn't come across that and there's a short yeah. yeah so I think um, the the committee did discuss at length the balancing to your point yeah. it's an expensive compliance matter but PCE has had held a core value yeah. of meeting our compliance obligations in every which way that we can. We are fortunate that we have a healthy balance sheet. Um, others don't, and sometimes that may impact them in different ways. But I think the general direction was let's continue to have our good relationship at the CPUC to maintain our credibility in that regard and avoid points and other uh, consequences that come with willful not compliance, right? If we can't comply because there's no RA to be bought, that's a whole nother thing. So that, that was that. And then uh, just like you know, on Friday afternoon, late in the day, uh, we, the surplus fund committee met and made good progress. Um, unfortunately, we didn't make it through all the different categories of discussion, but um, it was a healthy discussion. And um, I don't think we'll, unless you want to do any more report after that, I think we're going to pick up the discussion this week or next just to keep it going and get to some recommendations with the goal of having them to um, to the board in October, but if necessary, it'll be November, but we're on the right track. You want to say about that? Okay. Um, then the next is just an FYI. And the board is going out on retreat to Costa Noa next Wednesday and the Thursday. The board. Oh, sorry. The staff. Um, and everyone's eyes went, what? Uh, the staff is going out on retreat to Costa Noa next week. Um, and we're very much looking forward to that. And then the information, or at least some of it, that comes out of that retreat um, will help inform how we structure and um, provide feedback for the board retreat, which you all know is in November. 
So I just wanted to have that up there as an FYI. And uh, Mark, you do a three minute legislative update. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are in the very home stretch for the uh, 2023 legislative session. Uh, by the end of this week, they'll be done in Sacramento. Um, and typically uh, in recent years, uh, the weekend prior to the last session uh, is eventful because bills have to get into print 72 hours prior to their being voted on. Um, had feelers out uh, this morning and over the weekend, haven't heard of anything major developing. So uh, it's still possible, but, uh, but it hasn't been the radar yet. Um, in the order of uh, items listed uh, on the board, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, AB 1373. Uh, this was the governor's effort uh, initially in a trailer bill form uh, to create a central procurement entity. Uh, the governor uh, is uh, particularly interested in seeing that offshore wind, which uh, could be a, an incredibly expensive venture, uh, has the resources uh, for development. Um, our concern, uh, the concern of CCAs was uh, how uh, and who is a central procurement entity. Um, 1373 was clarified in the last week uh, at a hearing before the Senate uh, Energy Committee uh, that the Department of Water Resources would be the sole uh, central procurement entity. Yes, we're appreciative of that uh, limitation. Uh, the other key issue. Um, regarding uh, CPE was um, that uh, language was inserted at the uh, hearing that would uh, continue to allow uh, CCAs to procure uh, resources. Um, it means maintains our ability to do that, uh, except on those uh, areas where DWR is particularly involved. So uh, with that limitation, uh, Cal CCA and other CCAs have gone to a neutral position uh, the bill will uh, proceed, uh, and we, we have a letter of draft uh, that we signed today that we'll submit for the next hearing, which is tomorrow in uh, appropriations. Um, and uh, it's, it's expected that the bill will be passed before the end of the week. Um, support of the bill. Yeah, uh, this was a, essentially an agreement between the, uh, the uh, triumph of the uh, leader of the Assembly, Senate, and, and the governor's office. Um, two other things. But, yes. Before you leave, yeah, can yeah, you yeah. just say how that will impact us? Yeah, I was just kind of. So it will. Uh, yeah. um, so we, we will not be in the uh, um, business of procuring offshore wind uh, at this point. Um, that will be the um, purview of the Department of Water Resources. Um, but we will be able to continue to procure other energy resources. Uh, CCA will continue to have that ability. And what so I was planning that. to do is ask Mark to, to once this is passes, which we think it will, because there are a number of other sort of there's this thing is layered. And so we went to neutral, we meaning the CCA community went to neutral on a couple of you know changes at the very end, but uh, it's sort of one of those where you have to hold your nose and move to neutral to be a good player in Sacramento. And so um, it's not great. For us. And so I've asked Mark, he'll come back. I think it's better when we can have a full um, more delineation of exactly what the impacts will be on procurement. Is that fair, Mark? I think that's fair. All right. And the uh, you know, bill is still a, a, a work in progress. So until uh, final passage, we don't know exactly what it will say, but uh, we anticipate that uh, change going forward. You're so much more optimistic now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. It'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> Let's see what's next there. Uh, climate bond. Um, so there is uh, there was a bill in the assembly in the Senate that would uh, eventually lead to a climate bond. Um, those were put on hold. Those were made two year bills uh, in the last couple of weeks. And the reason for that is that the um, governor wants to um, have some mental health related uh, bills on the March uh, 2024 primary ballot. Um, and so all of the other uh, bond measures that were in the uh, it works. Um, we're delayed and made two-year bills, uh, so we'll take that up uh, starting next year. Uh, it would essentially give us uh, the legislature until probably next June uh, or uh, later to, uh, to get bills uh, through the legislature so that they would appear on the uh, fall 2024 ballot. Um, questions on that one? Next is... Uh, I skipped 537. Uh, our bill uh, to amend the Brown Act, uh, SB 537, sponsored by Senator Becker, 
um, is uh, being jockeyed on the floor by Assembly Member Hart. It's on the floor of the Assembly. We think today, uh, I believe the Assembly goes into session at one o'clock. Uh, we were number 70 something on the list on Friday. They turned before they got that far down the list. So we're hoping that, uh, that we'll maintain our position and uh, it will come to a vote. Uh, Senator, uh, Assembly Member uh, Hart is also uh, jockeying the uh, Speaker Rebus' bill on uh, extension of COVID. Uh, for, for, uh, sort of being a natural for us to, to handle the bill uh, and uh, for Senator Trek to handle the bill. And the last thing, uh, big news uh, on the 28th of August, uh, the Senate, uh, in somewhat of a surprise announcement, uh, announced that the caucus had agreed that uh, Senator uh, Mike from Marin, he represents a coastal strip that runs from Marin through Sonoma up to uh, the Oregon border, uh, that he will be the next Senator pro tem. Uh, and uh, that will not take effect until next year. Um, but uh, Senator Boyer uh, has been uh, very active on CCA issues over the years. He has three CCAs uh, in his uh, Senate district. And uh, so uh, that, that will take place. Uh, it's a smooth transition. Uh, Caucus uh, primarily unanimously voted uh, for that transition. Uh, I would note that he is termed out in uh, 2026, so it will be a short-term time uh, at the top of the Senate, but uh, we we'll look forward to that uh, transition. Follow. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there are questions. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. That's your son. That's it. That's it for me. Okay. Next oh, time. sorry. Both the positions. Uh, I think you've all heard. we're we're moving ahead with a solid group of interviews for COO and CFO. Uh, those will be starting hopefully this week, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but we've got a great a great group, so I think we're we will be in good shape. And you have applications for those grants. That's that one's been tougher to fill. Um, but hopefully the city leadership is going to help us. We did talk to them. They thought that was a $60,000 a year job and didn't realize it's a $150,000 a year job. In a city where the median household income is 68, that is a very good job. So I am actually, I think Paul was shocked at that and that we would invest that kind of money into hiring somebody of that quality in their community. And um, so, again, these are the kinds of things they just didn't understand, you know, were helpful to me in person. Hopefully, we're going to get that built soon. It's been open for a while. More time. Okay, that does conclude my report. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is discussion regarding PCB's customer support program. Uh, directors, uh, this is Ramal Reyes, uh, uh, Director of Energy Programs, uh, and here to present on two items uh, for you this morning. One is the uh, prospective uh, customer service center, uh, and second will be on the GovPD or Government Solar uh, Program. Uh, on this first item, I want to flag that uh, this is actually a joint item with account services. Uh, so the board uh, memo that you received uh, was from both Leslie Brown and myself. Uh, Leslie, however, is on travel at the moment, so I'm presenting on both of our, our behalf. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do here uh, is provide some context on this conversation. Uh, uh, this is in relation to uh, uh, prospectively bringing in-house uh, call center. Uh, I'd like to provide some context for that conversation, discuss the uh, problem um, that we're attempting to solve and how this relates to uh, our overall vision uh, under the board's uh, direction in terms of the one-stop shop, what other peer agencies are doing, perspective approach, uh, and uh, follow-on details. And what we're looking for here is direction from the executive committee whether or not to proceed on this uh, exploration that we're doing here. Next slide. Uh, first, some quotes from customers, which are part of the driving force here. Many of you have heard these things. There's a lot of complexity, particularly around building electrification, confusion. Customers want more guidance. You know, how much is it going to cost? You know, the research. Uh, 
uh, getting estimates, they want more confidence in being able to proceed. Many of you have heard these things and provided that feedback on a number of occasions in prior, prior board meetings, but this is really part of the driving force uh, behind this conversation. Next slide. And many of you will recall as part of the analysis, the decarbonization analysis that we did last year and the recommendations coming out of that, um, we are envisioning a significant uh, expansion in our residential uh, electrification services in particular. Uh, we last just discussed this with the full board in March uh, and that that uh, expansion will include the ability to do whole home electrification to be able to do more homes and to provide better services to customers to address those concerns, including uh, the one-stop shop, uh, live technical assistance where somebody can call and get questions answered, and a turnkey service option for customers. So if they don't want to get into all the details of finding a contractor and everything that's involved in that, we have somebody that we can turn to and customers can say, just handle it for me and we'll get it installed for you. Um, that's the big vision. Uh, the RFP for the turnkey services is already on the street. Um, so we are looking forward to receiving proposals on that uh, element of the service. And I should note here, the one-stop shop or all website perspective requirements are already under development there. And we're still scoping out exactly how the concierge will come together and anticipate coming back to the board at a later date with details of that. Next slide. Now, as we started digging into what this uh, will mean and, and fulfilling that vision, what it will need is we become more cognizant that it represents a pretty significant change in the nature of our relationship with customers. So our relationship today is very transactional. Somebody does something, they get an electric vehicle, they install a heat pump water heater. They say, hey, I've done this good thing. Send me the rebate. It's very transactional. Uh, so we do get some information back. We do surveys and get satisfaction information about their satisfaction with the program, satisfaction with contractors, with the product, and those sorts of things. But it's very, like I said, it's very, very transactional. And here we're moving towards a much more ambitious um, set of services. And it will move us much more towards a deeper relationship with customers and one that may last over years as they undertake the process of implementing clean energy actions in their life and home and so forth. And so a lot of that, um, we see a need to, uh, for really prioritizing three major elements. One is to be really customer centric in our engagement with customers be more data-driven. I would say we're relatively data-driven today, but we have much more data-driven and of course, more scalable in our overall approach. Next slide. Now we have a bit of a problem today. Um, this slide is busy, uh, but it does reflect what we have today from the standpoint of the customer support architecture. Uh, let me explain what's going on here. Vertically, you have different uh, customer segments and horizontally, you have different layers associated with the customer support that we provide today. So uh, in the leftmost column, we get general inquiries from just about everybody that flows through either an email inbox support at potential clean energy or an 800 line. Uh, and that flows into the Calpine Customer Support Center, which is actually a subcontract customer support center. So we're a couple layers removed from the customer support center. We have, of course, key accounts where it's more personal. Uh, the relationship is more personal with our key account representative, uh, Justin Pine. Uh, and then in each program area, looking at residential, we have email inboxes, and then we have uh, the programs at and then we have both phone and email that go to specific partners that are administering our relationship with the customers in those particular customer uh, uh, programs. Um, next. So the vendors are taking the calls. In and most speaking on our, on our behalf. And that's right. That's, that's to be that's really clear about that. 
-hmm. It's confusing and we don't have, sorry, as much quality control over that as we would like. Exactly. Correct? And Perfect. that's program by program. That's so right. when you look up their clear result handles, the EVs, that's right. charging, that's right. RHA handles the home upgrades yeah. and grid is handling, I guess, some EVs. Yeah, that are the EV rebate, that's correct. So, um, uh, so, and, and, and there was a logic to this in the, in the early days where we were very lightly staffed, where we had relatively few programs, this was the fastest way to deploy um, programs and immediately get the ball rolling, if you will. Uh, but it is starting to represent, uh, present challenges. So just going through these again, I mentioned Calpine and the, uh, the call center there. That call center, again, is two steps removed from us. Uh, it primarily handles account and billing related inquiries. Uh, but increasingly, they also get program related questions and they can answer certain very basic questions, but mostly they have to escalate that to the programs team today. Uh, next. And then as Sean was calling out, we have a range of different partnerships that are very program specific. So EV rebates, we have great alternatives that handle that. They do a very good job <clears throat> with those questions. Um, we have RHA on our uh, low income home upgrade program, same thing, they do a very good job handling those things. But there is little relationship between the two and frequently customers are increasingly asking about more than one thing. And so there's no, there's no uh, ability to be able to clearly support that. It gets escalated to the programs team and then they respond, we respond later um, to the customer. But right now is the only thing that comes straight to us from key accounts? Well, we have key accounts, yes, that come straight to us. And then we have a program specific email address, programs at PCE. That also comes straight to us. It has a wide range of different questions that come in through that. Some of, some of the transactions, customer interactions are very case, case management related things and where we do need to handle it or where we need our, our administrative support to handle it. But, but again, if someone comes in through grid alternatives and they get in like a vehicle, we can't say, oh, did you consider solar? Here's how you would do it. Cross market, because they're siloed, right? Uh, so we're seeing this as a real challenge from the standpoint of really providing the kind of quality and customer centric uh, support that um, uh, we think likely would be needed to be most effective uh, going forward. Next slide. So uh, at the board level, there have been um, uh, a number of discussions around the need for a one stop shop. That discussion has primarily centered on a website that one stop shop is or could be. And we are moving forward with those elements based on uh, uh, direction from the board and feedback that we've received. And that includes all the things that we've talked about previously, including better customer information, uh, in, uh, possible marketplace, uh, various calculators and tools, uh, contractor network. Uh, guidance and things on that order. Um, however, we are uh, seeing that there probably would be value in expanding the notion of one-stop shop uh, to include the phone side of this. Next. Wait, wait, before you leave that book, can I just ask Yes, please. So, so this is the customer view, which I think that's absolutely the right way to look at this. But what I don't see up there, and I just may be missing it, is uh, the rebates because oh, rebates, yes. rebates are coming from a whole multitude of different areas and from a customer perspective I, there, there are different reasons for that one stop shop concept but a critical one is so they can have in one place what the different rebates are because there's so many is just overwhelming and Yes. I know lots of people just don't pursue it. Yes, uh, and that is a problem, and we are looking at that. Uh, next, please. So the concept here is to view the um, phone or real-time interaction, because it could be chat, it could be uh, also email, it could be included here. Uh, the notion that we uh, could include in the notion of one-stop shop an additional set of 
of services that are all housed in the same place so that there's coherent support for the customer. So this would include all of the account status and billing uh, kinds of questions that currently goes through the CalPlan call center, but also things like program navigation, eligibility, what, you know, what incentives are available, uh, uh, what services uh, do we have to offer, uh, 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 having a me mechanism for referrals to particular um, additional needs that the customer may have, a uh, status of rebate, for example, Calpine Call Center can't do status of rebates. Um, and so uh, this is uh, a potential broader vision around the, the one-stop shop. Next slide. Uh, so we've begun, uh, begun investigating uh, this uh, in terms of what our peers have been doing. Three of our peer agencies have already or will be moving in this direction. So MCE and Clean Power itself have already moved, uh, implemented their in-house call centers. Uh, San Jose Clean Energy is, uh, is planning to do so. Uh, and MCE is reporting significant improvements in the quality of their customer interactions. So improved response times, uh, better uh, customer retention. This was interesting for me. So they get calls and saying, I want to opt out. And their retention of those opt outs is much higher than it was previously with the <laughs> um, And also they substantially increased their interaction with Spanish speaking customers. Uh, and the sense is, and I, I don't know that there's clarity around on this, but the sense is that it's a much more sort of personal interaction uh, and much uh, higher quality than uh, than their previous call center offerings. So uh, they've seen substantial increase in call volume from Spanish speakers. Next slide. Uh, so there are obviously many things operationally that would need to be considered here. Uh, we, uh, assuming um, uh, the feedback is positive, continue to explore this. Um, we would see this as a phase transition, so we would be layering in programs into the into the customer support center over time. Uh, we would possibly still rely on uh, Calpine for a fallback uh, to address over call overflow um, of situations that can occur. Um, we would also be uh, not looking to do a complete overhaul of all our systems. So MC actually did a complete overhaul of their. Uh, 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 CRM. Uh, as part of that, we would not advise that in the short term. Uh, at least uh, we would continue to use the Calpine CRM that will help reduce costs and smooth the transition. Uh, so these are some of the elements of a perspective approach. Next. Uh, we have, uh, you know, high level uh, budget estimates here. So we do see additional costs, obviously, in terms of bringing on board the staff and some systems work, although not major systems work. Um, and we would see savings as a result, but still a net cost at the end of the day. Uh, it's important to know that um, we would be, assuming we move forward, we would be looking to uh, have um, call center representatives that are higher quality than what we have today. Uh, and so the uh, getting getting quality uh, staff, making sure they are fully trained uh, would be very high priorities. And the, then this team would be uh, managed under under the account center uh, account services uh, department. It is the avoided new program avoiding a cost that doesn't currently exist? That's correct. So uh, so in addition to the Calpine call center, um, savings which would need to be negotiated with Calpine. So this is um, uh, you know early stage discussion with Calpine, but we would need to get much deeper. We would phase out grid and over time phase out some of the other elements. And then as we move forward into the turnkey and concierge services, though, if we don't have a call center, we will still need a way to take those calls. And so we are anticipating some extra costs associated with that if we don't move to the um, in-house general call center. Okay, so let me understand. So what you're saying is that the doing our own call center would cost seven thousand dollars for four people plus the systems, and that we would, assuming that this is what we negotiate, we would say. Uh, 
$170,000 in current costs, plus some projection on future costs that we'd be saving. That's on a current cost, we'd save $170,000. So in fact, it's costing us $380,000 more. Uh, yes, that's correct. That's fair. The avoided cost there is, is having our own person to pay. And would we do the call center here? It does not have to physically be in the office, but, the, but if it's not, then we're going to pay for some space. Uh, not necessarily. Many call center centers are now offering uh, operating the remote staff. Now, uh, I, I should note, and, and Leslie is much deeper on this, this topic, but the sequence of events would be first uh, to hire a call center manager that would help us work through all the policies and operational details. Exactly. But these days, it's kind of amazing. Call center reps, including some of Calpine's, are from home. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. But I do think, you know, and we have this office space until 2026. That's a whole nother discussion that I have some thoughts about to share, but um, we of course would have space for them to be here, have a physical location if they're local. And it may be that, you know, we try to hire folks just as part of economic development, whether it's here or in Spanish as a job creation yep. opportunity as well. What do these jobs pay? Uh, so for the CSRs, uh, I think we, I have to defer to Leslie, but, um, the manager, we had been budgeting 150. And so the CSRs, I think are about a hundred. I think this would be something we can really, again, this is a perfect example of things that we could talk to about with Spanos, especially if they're virtual and they don't have to come here. Yeah. At least one, no. But so this is all, that's yeah. all we have to figure that out. And that's only if this body of the board is interested in having us continue to search. Julie. Oh, this is not a question. Sorry. Are we doing questions first? Um, go ahead. Oh, whatever. Um, I'm interested. Definitely. I think this is definitely something we should be looking at. I'd uh, like to hear more as you learn more, um, especially once you talk to the managers and things. Maybe that there's pros and cons to having people in house and how the training goes and things like that. Um, we've all been talking to call centers where people have to get a supervisor and ask, you know, you ask that question that I don't know the answer to. How does that work if they're virtual versus in house and all that? But um, I think everything you show us right now sounds like it's worth looking into, plus the jobs creation factor, which is a bonus too. So, you know, I've built a company that built call centers literally all of them. I did not know this, so he could have done this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get, we did the technology, but. We manage lots of people that manage Paulson. So the what what's being proposed for the call center is very complex. If the, the call center agents, uh, I think that your assumption is right that they'd be able to uh, properly address the opt out issue and retain people as MCE have the experience. I think that's totally doable with our own call center agents. For the programmatic stuff, it's 100% a transfer. So, you know, the big issue in call centers is being able to resolve issues with the first person you get and the best technology gets you to the right person so you can resolve issues instead of being transferred to multiple people, which those whole lines and those transfers are always the problem in calls. So uh, in this case, there's going to have to be transfers. So we just have to think that through as you're designing it, because the programmatic stuff is going to have to go to somebody who has a level of information that a call center agent won't have. Yeah, and Carlos. So 
In terms of the, the subject matter, in terms of the question you're trying to address, this is an absolute pain point. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's nobody out there that does this. <laughs> and I see this all the time in projects where people are like, they're working on their house. I'm, I want to make my house really green. How do I do it? And they end up asking me, but I'm actually not the best person for them to ask. There's just, this is, you're addressing something. In a, it's it's customers out there are actually really like, want, I mean, they want to get EVs, they want to add batteries and solar energy, it's trying to figure out the best way to do it. And this is, I mean, this is a great way to address that. I think the, the transfer question aside, it's actually really, it's, 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 it's a really, really, really hard thing to do in terms of just social. I think about in terms of homes, but I'm sure it's right. like, mm -hmm. sense too, number one. And, you know, the Building electrification and transportation electrification is going to add millions of dollars to our revenue over the year as we as we if we do this right. So I mean, it's just this is this is an investment that's something that actually builds our uh, top line um, and ultimately. So I I think this is the right direction. That's the right thing. Thank you. I want to clarify one thing: the the, the call center would not be doing the technical assistance no. that I mentioned in the vision. So that would that would definitely be a transfer or redirect. Uh, this is, you know, handling of the frontline conversations that, that customers can. Yeah. Okay. I'm dovetailing on what Jeff said. Some people I've spoken to who called PCE where they were interested in energy savings in their homes and they wanted to learn about hospitals. And they had the impression they were going here and there and everywhere, but they gave up. A couple of people who were very technically minded thought, oh, I can do this. I'm, you know, I'm going to work with my contractor and sub it out to people. And they were just as frustrated. So part of this, I would just suggest that considering you're the expert on call centers is not waiting for people to They don't know enough about it. So more or less an assessment script to go down, so what do you think you might want? Have you considered solar? Have you considered a battery? Do you have a local contractor you like to work with? Would you like for me to refer you to a PC? <laughs> Size of your space, blah, blah, blah. So that that person then, if there's a really technical question, just like you said, they can hand it over to the manager. Mm -hmm. But it, it it gets a real basis of information, which then it can be handed to a PCE contractor. Here's all the information. And it, it still solidifies that person who has the uh, yeah. even if it takes someone getting back to yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think you answered part of my question about who's going to handle the issues around rebates and, and you know, all the stuff related to the contractors that are doing the programs. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think this is going to cost actually more than what you have here. I do too. I, um, yeah. And I think we're going to learn as we go and who knows, maybe, I mean, it's as much as AR, it's, as AI can be a problem, I think just in terms of replacing humans, I think we may wind up in a situation where we have a hybrid AI system, right? Through the moving mm -hmm. people into you know, real time communication. Mm -hmm. um, but again, this is going to cost money. Uh, but I think that, you know, I, I ran into a friend who just installed uh, a heat pump in their home in Palo Alto, and they said their process for the rebate was seamless because it went through Palo Alto utilities, mm -hmm. right? It was just super easy. She was like blown away. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, that's the type of customer experience we want. I don't know how we get there, but so, yep, maybe it's just going to go to a million dollars a year. I don't mean that, Jeff. So I think that uh, the, in defining this, you really have to think about what Jeff said, because this has to be defined from the customer perspective. We're going to end up from our cost to find it from the call center perspective, because that's where our cost is going to be. But the, to set the whole thing up, it has to be defined from the customer perspective or else we're going to fail. And it's not just going to mean trying to do something that hasn't been done, but that there's a huge need for, which is a big deal. But there's going to be real pressure on our program people to be responsive to those phone calls because they're going to get 
transfers from a call center agent and people, when they're in a call center, expect to be taken care of right away. So they're, and they're not going to be because they're going to have to leave a message for somebody. And so there has to be, uh, you know, a culture that people get back to those calls immediately. Because yeah. otherwise, this is not going to work. Yeah. Service uh, level requirement. <clears throat> Carlos, then Jeff, then Julie. Or no, it's Carlos already with Jeff. Oh. I'll just point out, we, we, give, we give our customers prizes for doing this effectively, right? Every year we have the annual the Building Electrification Leadership Awards where we actually pick a few projects in our territory and say, this, these people figured this out and we're, we're giving them a couple thousand dollars for doing So we, we, we're actually recognizing how complicated this is and how hard it is to get it right. So it's sort of bringing in and capping those people at starters. I just, I just want to be more to kind of acknowledge that this is difficult and important. Sounds like we have a lot of expertise in the board too, which is great. Um, but I would just also um, don't forget about uh, the peer agencies. Maybe yeah. whatever they're doing, if it's working, let's let's talk all about it. Yeah, all of the yeah. all of those agencies that are doing it right. Um, is the next step that if we say it's we're interested, the, then you would do you bring it to the full board, or how is this? What's the next steps for this? If we're giving the thumbs up. Oh, answer that. I mean, that we do a much deeper dive on this. We just wanted to yeah gun check this. Um, and we would, I would suggest bring it back here first. There's additional vetting. And then once we can get to a place where you're ready to recommend, then we bring it to the full board. I also want to say that I think it would be useful to come back to this body with a full explanation of not only sort of the call center investment, but what the plans are for technical assistance reps, because we have Blake and then we have an additional person that's already budgeted to hire, but by the kind of service that we're talking about, it's gonna, you know, and already the programs teams is doing this, but I think it would be good to give you guys the full picture of how we plan to staff it, so we meet there. Does that work? Yeah, that's good. What else do you need? Is there any public comment on this? Okay, I don't see any public comment. Any other comments from members of the board? Is there a next steps? Uh, there, well, there is a timeline uh, uh, slide here next. And just to, uh, as a frame of reference, uh, we uh, are looking to bring up some of the green uh, arrows, the residential turnkey services beginning in the second half of next year. That will start with the Direct and low income direct install portion, which will have less need for that sort of call support. Uh, and our aspiration, if you will, uh, uh, it would be to start doing the setup of this uh, in the first half of, of next year and start bringing the, the call center online then for the ramp up of the turnkey services as we move into the full turnkey um, uh, offerings to all the customers. And I would also note uh, next that we have other things under, under development. We will be coming to the board uh, next. Uh, uh, coming to the board with a new residential storage program. Uh, and uh, we would certainly want this to be up and running, I think, for um, that program uh, as well. And of course, we would be bringing up and, and other existing programs into that call center support um, over time. Uh, but this has been extremely helpful, and we'll take this back and uh, uh, be back with you uh, hopefully soon. Paul? Um, um. We went through all ACAC and heat pump coordinator and used the PCE recommended contractor that makes all the difference in the world. Neighbors who didn't have real problems. There's one thing I think we're missing. So if we go through a call center and go through programs, and by the way, the rebate were like lightning and so well done. But that confidence when you have that contractor that comes on site and already knows exactly what you need and can verbalize it to you is like gold. What are we doing to actually recruit more contractors? If we don't do that, because to me, this call center, if it ends up where someone says, I called a contractor and they told me they're two years out. And and even our contractor was very busy. And now he's even busier. Right. Somewhere we need to grapple with that. In a way, I would like to see us recruit contractors and say, become a PCE certified contractor 
and you're going to have a pipeline of business. Yeah, there are two things that we're doing. Uh, it has been a uh, longstanding pain point. Um, one is that our on-build finance program has been a phenomenal tool for recruiting contractors because they know it's it's they're very uh, helpful for customers and uh, they've actually been coming forward to enroll to be able to participate with the on-build finance program uh, at a rate of two or three to four a month. Uh, so it's been very quick. I mean, we, we've gone from having, you know, six contractors, more or less, that we were working with when we started in 2021 to, gosh, there are at least like 25 or 30 now that we're uh, engaged in in one way or another. Um, and so that's been very effective. So that's A. And then B is the turnkey service. We will have an in-house contractor that we recommend as an option. Of course, customers may still want to find their own for any number of reasons, and that's fine. Uh, but we will have a contractor that we can recommend and that we uh, will be responsive to, to, to customer yeah. needs. Well, one, uh, it still remains to be seen whether it's actually actually one firm or more than one firm. Uh, uh, and that's what the uh, RFP that we have on the street now will help us determine who exactly we'll be working with and, and whether it's one or more. Um, question. Um, so the other, the other, uh, it's like the point of sale situation, you know, like, um, when you walk into the client store and you're looking, how can we do a better job there? Right. So I, I just don't know how to do that. Like, can we share with them contractors But I've been working with my contractor and fighting him about if you need washroom, he's like, just put a gas one in and it's not electric. It's just a constant freaking battle. And yes. I just ran out my gas. Induction. And it's just, it's just, they do, they argue with you to keep interest. So, you know, so we need, it's like recruiting these people, but we just need a more general like training, which I know we've been doing more resistant. But so you have to train the client and the client. Just say, okay. But I would love it if we could find an appliance store that was willing to give up all the gas appliances and just sell electric that we can partner with and say, just go there. Like, go there, anything you buy, you can install. This would be an interesting thing to maybe bring up with the joint group looking into uh, that. Yeah. Because this is like bigger than our service territory. So if we partnered with, oh, let's just say we kept it at the Bay Area because we're looking at the back end tools, yeah. that might be a place yeah. where we don't have to put that in our backpack, but we can share the load yeah. and figure right. it out. Because most people, I think I need a new washer dryer. Oh, PCE. Like, they don't even know. Like, they don't even know. So they're going to just, instead, they're going to go down to Lowe's and Depot. So, or is there a way we can incentivize them? Like, hey, we'll give you guys for every electric yeah. thing. You just have to be interested. You know, just partnering with something like that and saying, hey, we'll give you a hundred dollars for every electric thing you sell. Like, incentivize them to sell. Well, like yesterday, what we put us for the the new place and the home people didn't even they had taken out their entire electric HVAC area and put Halloween stuff there. So there were none to look at at the Santa Fe Home Depot. Mm -hmm. Very frustrating. It's super frustrating. Our service territory is probably running ahead of most of the Bay Area. Uh, we're running at about we estimate five percent of water heater installations or heat pump water heaters. Um, and uh, so it's very small. Uh, uh, eventually, um, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get to the point like with electric vehicles at the beginning, no dealership wanted, no, no salesperson and dealership wanted to sell these. But when the market started to tip, it's like, oh, okay, this is a real yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. um, driving volume. That's why I think setting up an incentive program for the appliance people, if you, and offer to everybody, like mm -hmm. anyone in Singapore County who's willing to get up all their gas appliances. And just stock electric. I, I, 
I think somebody needs to do a really deep dive analysis on this because that's going to apply to people that voluntarily choose to change out their appliance because they want to go to electric. But I think most people change out their appliance because the appliance fails. Well, that's my and, but, but wait, but when the appliance fails, then I'm not sure there's why we need a deep dive. I know where we, we had a home warranty and our, our, our water heater failed. And I went, let's get an electric water heater warranty. No possible way to get electric water heater with this warranty service. Yeah. If you want the warranty, you get a gas water heater. If you want to do it on your own, get a do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But we'd already paid for the warranty. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so until yeah. so the warranty people, and there's probably two or three real serious warranty services a lot of people use that. I just think someone needs to do a deep dive on yeah. on who replaces water heaters when and and what's the touch point to to increase the electric because right yeah. now and I think most people replace their water heaters or their furnaces when they fail. Yes, yeah, that's, that's true. Okay. But that is a really good point where we could say to Backnet or to Senator Becker, hey, we need to work with. Laura, the insurance commissioner, and we need to change this and say we need to legally change this at the state level and say mandate that if you're providing warranties in the state of California, you need to allow repair and replacement of both gas and electric. Like that to fight that bottom up, it's going to be a mess. You got to fight that top down. Good point. Okay, we need yeah. to move on. Anything else on this stuff? Did you get what you need? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, okay, so the next topic is solar and storage for public buildings, and we've got less than 45 minutes. All right. Hopefully, there is some complexity here. So, um, uh, please bear with me. Uh, we are providing here an update on uh, what internally we have been calling GovPV, but the, the acronym is trickling out. So, I'll use that. Uh, and the focus here is on round two, uh, which is substantially larger. Uh, and we wanted to um, uh, provide information on what the status is, what the underlying strategy is, and some key questions that we need uh, guidance on. Next slide. Uh, so we'll uh, go through, uh, again, an uh, overview of the program status, and then get into the uh, strategy and considerations. Next slide. Uh, so as many of you recall, uh, you know, this is the program putting solar and some storage on uh, local government uh, member agency uh, facilities. The pilot round is in construction uh, now. Our principal objectives are helping agencies reduce their energy costs, especially to uh, insulate uh, against rising pg e rates. Uh, and of course, many agencies have sustainability goals that this is helping meet and also supporting PCEs uh, uh, reaching its 20 megawatts of local power um, goal. Uh, so I mentioned the pilot, um, the RFP for round two has been issued and I will speak more about that uh, in a moment. Next slide. <laughs> Again, our general approach, just very briefly, we're providing technical assistance, design, financial analysis. We manage the procurement process. This is a group by with other agencies to help reduce the total cost. All of the financing is through a power purchase agreement, so there's no upfront cost for participating agencies. And we do this without any sort of profit motive and uh, in a transparent manner with all of the, uh, all of the agencies. Next slide. So round one installations have started. We're very excited about that. Uh, what you're seeing here is the San Carlos Rex uh, Youth Center. Uh, that installation is underway, but the panels are already on the road. Uh, it's 1.7 megawatts across the uh, 12 sites and three sites are slated for uh, batteries, which necessarily under the rules have to come after the solar is uh, uh, completed. Um, we're projecting over $15 million in savings to uh, the participating agencies uh, here for these systems. Next slide. Uh, and I should note, so construction is underway and should complete uh, perhaps uh, end of Q4, so starting Q1, uh, there are some questions around exactly how long pg e is going to take for uh, 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 the final uh, 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 
commercial, uh, allowing the, the uh, operations on the systems or some final steps from PG&E, but we do expect those to start coming online, certainly by the first quarter. Now, there are a number of things that are under the hood in this program that are key to, or in our view, to call out a lot of development work that came, uh, that has come along with this program. Uh, evaluation of multiple prospective financial partnerships, uh, vetting the process with securing the IPC. So that was new with the Inflation Reduction Act that we determined we could secure the IPC directly. We essentially developed a whole new business model um, around this program, and that included uh, developing the PPA, which uh, is a, a, a slightly customized version, um, but uh, as with all legal processes, everything takes longer than you expect uh, to bring those to closure. Um, there's a variety of risk management uh, elements, so insurance and, and uh, other risk management uh, elements uh, that came into uh, finalizing the, the program variety of operating protocols, some of which are still under development. We're going to be owning these systems over their 20-year life, so we're responsible for operations and maintenance. Uh, and we have uh, started generating some good visibility also uh, for PCE uh, as part of the program, so there, we were cited at length in Canary Media uh, just this last month. Next slide. Now, the discussions at the board level around this program have been at really operating at a very practical level in terms of getting solar out there, meeting our 20 megawatt goal. Uh, there's been limited discussion of some of the broader perspective vision, and I want to emphasize perspective uh, here around the program. Uh, but the initial business model where we are, we are providing a PPA, we're essentially the developer, uh, and we are generating ongoing revenues is a completely new business model for PCE. Uh, and so round one has allowed us to check that first box and say, we have developed a new, new business model. Um, we have uh, started work, but not completed how batteries are gonna fit into this. In theory, right, we could offer PPAs that are for both solar and storage. Now I'm gonna come back to that because there are some important consideration there. We could, in theory, continue on and expand to other market segments. So currently it's just member agencies, so cities and the county. We could do in round two, we started with other public agencies, but there's nothing in principle preventing us for us to go into the private sector um, uh, market segments, other commercial, residential. Again, this is all very hypothetical, but in theory that it's available to us. Uh, and one of the, perspective benefits of doing that is it really developing a completely alternative business model around what we're offering the community. In addition to the wholesale power and retail, retail rates, we can also offer uh, self-generation under EPAs as part of our ongoing business. Again, this is a big picture concept and uh, potentially something that we could explore. And we could potentially expand the PPAs to do more than just solar and storage. We could potentially add electrification, uh, EV charging in theory, could all be in theory bundled into something like this. Now there's substantial complexity in each of these gates. This is not a short-term project. This would be a long-term project and obviously a number of considerations that we would want for direction on. Next slide. So round two, I want to talk through some of the details in round two and get to some of the questions here uh, for uh, directors. Um, round two was accelerated because of the NEM2 deadline. In fact, in an ideal world, I think we would have taken a, a little more time uh, to do that. Uh, but with the phase out of NEM2, we knew that we wanted to get in there and get those interconnections in to maximize the opportunity for participating agencies. Uh, we did that. Uh, we got over 40 sites uh, as part of the interconnection process, and we have just released the RFP for round two. Um, as part of that, uh, we have included non-member agencies. So we have a couple school districts, we have sanitation districts and the like participating in that. Uh, there will likely be some attrition, so we don't know what's going to come at the bottom of the funnel in this, in this process, but 
uh, the RFP will help us determine pricing and that allows us to go back to the agencies with more specific detail. We do have an agency with non-customer meters. So the, uh, the uh, San Mateo College District participated. Uh, they are primarily a DA customer. A uh, question has come up is, well, why are we doing DA meters? Um, and we do not offer any incentives for things like EV charging on DA meters. But here we're seeing an opportunity um, with uh, the college district because it would essentially be to take over business that is currently going to DA and instead have that business come to us. Uh, and the uh, way the conversation has gone is this could be a prelude to potentially them bringing over their DA load to us. Now, I don't want to overstate that opportunity. There's a lot that would have to happen, but that has been part of the conversation with, with, with the college district. And none of this is subsidized at the end of the day. So we're getting all the money that we put in as capital comes back to us through the BBA. Now, um, as we dug into the round two portfolio, we surfaced that there were in fact two distinct sets of sites. Um, the first set, which we call the 2A group, uh, site the 33 sites, these are projects where solar only provides immediate economic benefit. And then there's the 2B sites, which are nine sites larger that are only gonna be economic with solar and storage. And this is a larger group of sites, including the community college district. And these are the B19 and B20 groups that have a high demand charges and low energy charges where solar only generally is not economical. And so, um, so we're approaching this now as two subgroups now within that round two. Next slide. So, I apologize, there are a lot of words on this slide. Um, uh, but there are a set of considerations around round two, which uh, we, we are looking for uh, feedback on from directors. Um, the first relates to the capital outlay. So the round, the two A sites, which is the smaller total system size with 4.5 megawatts more or less, is approximately $20 million in capital. That is already in the budget formats. So um, in prior discussions uh, with the executive committee, uh, uh, the suggestion was to, to continue uh, here with the model where PCE was providing the capital. Uh, and here we're continuing forward with the notion that we're doing this in the same way that we did round one. We have ownership, we're providing the PPA, et cetera. However, round two is much, much larger. We're talking $60 million just for the solar, an additional $8 million or more for the batteries. Again, we don't have exact pricing. The RFP will help us help provide pricing. Uh, and there are significant questions here now about, well, where should the capital come from? And obviously, there's an ongoing discussion around the surplus funds. This hasn't been suggested for the surplus funds. Uh, it's a very large chunk of change. Uh, and so if there's there are questions here about how this might be capitalized, assuming we decide to go forward. Um, so PC capital, there's third party capital, so private developers that might provide capital. There's the potential for bonds or iBank. Um, these are all options that potentially could be explored. Um, we would note here that a 4% rate, which is what the iBank offers today, uh, would basically mean a 50% increase in the cost of uh, the total cost of the project over 20 years. So it's every percentage point matters a lot in terms of the total dollars. Which potentially, sorry, which potentially takes it out of the money. Yes. The exactly. That's the tricky. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so we're not looking for a decision here. We're raising raising um, this for, for initial comment. We do plan to come back to the executive committee with more detail once we have more specific pricing through the RFPs. And there's no commitment on this at this stage. Is the 20 million in 2A ex using 
a 2% cost of capital. Uh, so we uh, we did incorporate a cost. Peter, help me out here in our, we have Peter Levitt on uh, program manager here. Uh, the cost of capital that we incorporated for PCE in the, in the two group. Um, I believe it was a 1% cost of capital, one or 2%. Why don't you get back to us when you have a chance on which it is, because that's a Big difference. significant difference. Yeah, and there's no commitment sure. at this point. So we, did provide, we did provide information to customers based on 2%. Okay. Uh, but uh, once we get the pricing and we can look at specific numbers, then that helps us in the evaluation of what, what might make sense going forward. And we would come to the executive committee, obviously, before anything is, is finalized. All right. Yeah, so just along the financing lines. So does this include or assume that um, the direct capture tax credit is available for financing? Yes, it does. Yes. Okay. And, and, and then we're we're fairly certain that it's gonna be available, it won't, won't get exhausted. I mean there's no expiration on the uh, on the tax credits. No, so there is a maximum cap every year. Right? Oh yes. I mean they're not in yeah, 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 right. Even though they're off books, they're not uh, th that's a good point. And on round two, Peter, we should capture that question. I was uh, multitasking on the previous question. What was the last question? Yeah. So the, the question is the uh, ITC cap and uh, the prospect of hitting that cap on any given year. Uh, so we need to investigate that and, and find out what our risk might be with round two on the ITC cap. What what is the, what, what is ref, what is um the ITC cap in this case? Yeah, let's, let's just yeah. let's just take that for investigation. That there there's an annual cap on uh, on ITC apparently, and, and so I'm not familiar with the details of that. But what uh, Director Romero is saying is that there is a cap, so we need to find out what that is. Okay, that's that's new. Just, um, just, I'll document yeah. it. Yeah, let's just take it for Mark Schultz. Uh, we have a, a outside counsel, tax counsel, that's been working with us. Um, so thank you for that. That's uh, important. Um, there are a series of other issues here as well. Um, one is a question of PCE ownership of assets. So with round one, we have we have taken a step into a new. Um, uh, responsibility, that's long-term ownership of assets. Uh, round one is not that big, uh, so and it's only solar. Um, uh, asset ownership uh, uh, tends to favor the ability to, to deliver better customer economics. Uh, if we have batteries, uh, we have more control of those batteries, so grid serving dispatch of the batteries, we would have direct control over. Uh, however, ownership also includes more operating requirements and other risks, and this is particularly true uh, when looking at the batteries. Um, and so, the full spectrum of risks there, you know, uh, theoretically many, uh, you know, potential for terminations and non-payment. We think it's not that high, particularly with round one. Uh, with round two, we're talking some non-member agencies, so possible uh, 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 slightly higher risk in our sense, but it's uh, non-zero. Uh, other legal issues that can arise, an accident can happen. Um, fire, especially with batteries, um, which is a legitimate risk. So uh, we have not yet looked at insurance associated with battery fires. Uh, so that's gonna be a, a major question if you were to go down the path of um, battery ownership. Um, there are operational issues, so if we are not successful in operating them to contracted requirements, we're at legal, we have legal uh, liabilities. Um, so uh, there's a large question on asset ownership. Um, if PC does not own the systems, then there may be other business models that we may want to consider around uh, those systems. Uh, and uh, that affects exactly what the contracting model is. Uh, next slide. We have a question. Yes. Uh, whether or not we own it, if we 
are able to contractually control the battery, do we get RA? So uh, we can, there, let me go to the next slide and, and speak to, to that. And no Peter, uh, I may um, ask you to jump in here. Next slide. So um, some of this information has been provided previous. I think the last time we talked about business models was early last year. So it's been quite a while. Um, but uh, our current round one, it has PCE in the middle of the contracting relationships. We have PPAs with each of the member agencies for each of the facilities. The member agents need to handle the construction and member agencies are then paying us under the PPA. And then we hire the equipment uh, uh, and installer contractor, the EPC, and they're only doing construction. So that's how round one operates today. Uh, in general, this model probably provides better customer economics than the alternatives, um, but we assume all of the associated risks. Now, again, these are uh, today solar only, so the risks are relatively low. Next. And there's only how many? 12, 12. there are 12 facilities. Uh, <laughs> Another model, which we explored very early on before the Inflation Reduction Act, has us with PPA in the middle has been uh, the term that was used. We have PPA with customers, but we also have PPA, a PPA behind us with the developer. So in this model, the developer owns the systems, is responsible for operations and maintenance, um, but the contractual relationships still come through us and the money flows come through us. Um, what this uh, in theory provides is a little more removed from the legal risk, non-zero though, if there's a non-payment risk, uh, we're in the line of that and we're still in the line of some legal risk, um, but we have more contractual control over things like battery use. We also have the option to acquire the system directly under the contract that we would have with the development. And then the third option, which some of our peers have been looking at, is for us not to be in the contractual relationship. We just handle facilitated group buy. And then each of the, um, the agency, participating agencies, just contract directly with the development. Here, we don't assume any of the risk. We're helping facilitate somewhat lower costs through the group, group by process. It's not clear to what degree we could have a side agreement around the battery use. We might be able to negotiate that. We might have to apply certain incentives for the developer to, to uh, want to do that. Um, but we are, this is the lowest risk for us. We're not in the, in the line, risk line, if you will. So let me pause there. Uh, Director DeGolia, to your question of RA, um, we certainly, uh, in, in the first two for sure, would be able to get load modification, which means that we modify our forecast going to the CEC and reduce our RA obligations. Um, Peter, I don't know, do we have any way to get like actual RA value through these projects? So it depends on the way that um, the customer, it depends on the type of rate that the customer is on. For customers that are on energy only rates, and this, I'll, I'll, I'll pause real quick and say it, it's a complicated answer. Um, and I, I don't think it's worth it to get into all the nitty gritty details. But for some customers, we can certainly get resource adequacy from the systems. However, the customer side economics, the customer side benefits of those batteries for those customers are not very strong. And then conversely, some customers who have demand rates, demand charges, um, benefit a ton from having battery storage. However, PCE has limited ability to get resource adequacy from those systems because they're providing demand charge management. So that's the that's the long and short of it. Yeah, you can't double dip on that. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. You sort of can, but mostly you can't. So it's not a, re a leading reason to do it. Reading this, Raphael, 
I just couldn't help but constantly in my mind saying, what are the CCA doing? Yeah. So um, there are four peer agencies that have gone down this path or something similar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for better or for worse, we're ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, other, other peers, bless their hearts, have been very vocal mm -hmm. about their programs um, and uh, have been challenged mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And then have turned to us and say, what are you going to do? <laughs> which one were they trying? Uh, so um, East Bay and CPA uh, had uh, both been marching down a flavor number three. Um, I have to check with Cal Choice and, and actually CPA. I, I, I'm, I'm now not remembering exactly where, where they landed. Uh, uh, they're they're in in the middle of of a procurement process. Um, That's like Peter was going to say something. Peter. Yeah, I was I was just going to say you know it it's worth noting that. Um, well, first, EBCE is pursuing um, path path two here. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned that they were pursuing path three. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I missed one. You're right. Um, and I mean, just some um, editorialization on path three. It it doesn't really add a lot. You know, we don't add a lot of value pursuing path three. A lot of our customers can't pursue PPAs under path three. They're just the projects are too small, um, and they don't have the bandwidth to negotiate a PPA with each, you know, for each site. Um, you know, PCE streamlines the PPA negotiations process pretty, pretty significantly. Um, so, just commenting on the merits of the first two models here, above the, the yes. third model. But, but the the first model has given the end user customer who are our agencies, the best price. Absolutely. So that, I mean, when we're looking at it from the benefit to the agencies versus to PCE, number one is by far the best model, which is why we chose it. And I would uh, add that the most significant complicating factor is, is batteries mm -hmm. here, which is, Part of the reason, and I, uh, there has certainly been a desire, we have had a desire to move more quickly, but the deeper we got into it, the more complexities we, we, we surfaced, and also the NAM rules are a whole other thing, also then complicated the timing. Um, but I, I apologize. No, 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 no. I was just going to tag on what you said. You are correct that in this first round, um, our member agency partners got a very good deal um, with significant discounts. In the second round, the um, budgeting that we're doing for that has uh, us being sort of uh, cost neutral because we took a loss lead on it first. We learned a lot and it was a good thing to do, but we're not we're not anticipating offering that kind of discount because we're not going to take on that kind of um, financial. But even if we cover, so this is a cost of capital issue, and even and we're going to cover ourselves more in the second round, which right. we agreed to do. Right. But it's still a better deal for the memory uh, agencies oh, no than the other model, right. and particularly yes. the third model. That's correct. Yes. Fine. So, Rafael, when you look at the second model, there, we're almost like a sales agent in between. Challenges faced on this first round, getting contractors to actually schedule work and be involved with us. Is that going to present a problem if we went the second route, getting contractors who go, we don't need you, we're busy enough, <coughs> don't bother us. Or are there advantages to one or the other in terms of dealing with the contractors? Uh, we are not anticipating difficulty engaging a, a developer or EDC contractor to, to build the systems. Um, the challenge with the second model, there may be two challenges that have maybe more, at least in my mind, most significant. One is that the cost of capital will be much higher. Mm -hmm. And that, as Sean noted, may knock out some systems from the standpoint of economics. Mm -hmm. And then the second issue is uh, it, it, it puts us in the line of legal risks. So 
if for whatever reason a contract is terminated and there's a legal matter and we're not able to to receive payments including the termination fees in particular then we've borne all all of that financial risk because we still have to pay the developer regardless if something happens like uh, it includes batteries and there's battery fire you know the liability can be very large now we will protect ourselves with our agreement with the developer but that's not a 100% guarantee that we don't take a hit there and their reputational um, uh, factors as well. Now, so we would stand to receive more benefit from the standpoint of battery control, but we assume those risks. Is there a middle ground where we cost share of the ownership? There is a two A, is there not? Uh, In the middle A. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the 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 ownership. Um, the developer will want to keep ownership of the systems at least through the uh, uh, tax credit required term, which is five years. In theory, then we could negotiate taking ownership. There may be a cost, but taking ownership of the systems. But then again, we, we assume all the liabilities. Let me ask a question. Is, is there a model where we do with the solar systems the same that we did with tranche one, uh -huh. where, where we use model A for the deployment of the solar system. Yeah. And we're going to do the solar systems first. Yeah. And then have, use model two for the batteries, where the developer gets the tax credit for the batteries yeah. and assumes the burden of the risk, and, and they're going to be more expensive. So maybe that's going to price the batteries out for right. a significant number of those to be customers and we have to consider that but if there could we look at that hybrid model uh and peter we had a little bit of conversation around this maybe you can you can comment yeah i can i can comment i raised my hand to make a couple separate comments but first to director golia's question um we certainly can finance the battery storage equipment using model two after we pursue uh, direct ownership of the solar equipment in model one. That is, that is certainly an option. Um, that said, uh, it's worth noting that if we still have a major capital outlay consideration, if we, if we finance all of the solar that we're planning to develop in, in these portfolios um, under model one, and that was going to be one of the things that I, one of the one of the comments I wanted to offer for the um, to frame this discussion a little bit more, you know, if we finance the solar equipment, as Raphael pointed out in, in an earlier slide, that is still a sixty million dollar capital outlay that PCE needs to either bear on its balance sheet or raise financing for through a third party arrangement like an iBank, um, uh, and the you know that's. That's a lot of money, and we're looking to potentially scale up this approach, which is why I think that we need to be considering the the middle pathway here, this PPA, the CCA in the middle option, um, because we're, you know we want to scale up this effort if possible. We want to find a scalable approach to raising the capital for these projects, and so you know we need to have our eye on not just this portfolio but future portfolios as well and expansions to this approach. You know, what, what model gets us there? Peter, and I know we've, we've had some discussion about this, but I want to tag off of what Chair Golia said, because I think we have been talking about recently that potentially PCE could Self finance and or third party finance, maybe a combination for round two, and have a developer pay for um, and own the battery systems on a preferred basis where we would still have access to load modification because we essentially were the agent, we brought the customers to that developer but we do not bear the risk of ownership of those batteries. And it, you know, it is a little bit like trying to get your, have your cake and eat too, but I think the market is young enough that we potentially do that. The 
thing that surprised me in your analysis is that the battery component of round two was not nearly as high as I thought it would be. And the solar is high. I mean, that 60 million is a big price tag. So there are sort of two different nuts to crack. But I have to say, just from where I sit today, I'm very interested in not necessarily taking on the legal risk of battery ownership at this time, mm -hmm. because the market is still pretty young and technology is going to be changing and all of that. So there oh, might well, be something in there to explore. I also yeah, want to note with respect to battery risks is that we haven't done a proper full-fledged analysis of the legal risks associated with different ownership pathways for battery storage. Um, there are ways to mitigate risk to own battery storage, and there are also additional risks that we take on by being in the middle of a financing arrangement for the battery storage itself. For instance, if there is a if there is a um, fire event with one of the batteries at a customer location and we have a contract associated with that resource, that would still um, come up as a PCE organized um, asset and you know would still have a reputational impact to PCE. So it's I you know I just want to um, caution us against saying you know if we um, at pursue model two, then we are, we're you know we're hands off from all associated risks with thermal runaway for battery storage. Could you do model three for the batteries and model two for the solar? And then I'll I won't ask you. You can certainly pursue model three for any of these systems. Um, you know uh, the benefit is that um, we really are are you know not associated with the resources in that case. Um, contractually, but we still have a reputational, you know, we organized this program. It is a PCE run program. And so we have our name on the program at large still. Um, the drawback is that, as I mentioned, um, you know, a San Carlos with a 29.5 kilowatt solar energy system, that project in the real market never gets a PPA. There is no company that serves a solar or a battery storage PPA for that type of project. Just realistically, there are no firms that do that. Um, and and it probably does not make sense for a San Carlos to enter into a PPA for that type of project um, directly with the developer. Um, but for you know the PCE aggregation model, that's why the, the first two models drive so much incremental deployments of solar and battery storage is because we're um, – systematizing the approach to these deployments. Maybe I can uh, validate what I, I think uh, we're we're hearing. Um, one on the batteries that we're we don't want to venture down the pathway of, of ownership today. We want to explore some alternatives. Um, Maybe we can validate that sense from directors. I think before you get there, you've got to do that thorough risk analysis, which hasn't been done. I'm, I'm not really sure how much risk there is. I mean, I hear there's risk. I'm not terribly worried about the reputational risk. I think we're trying to do something that others haven't done, and this is the right thing for us to try to do. I, I'm, I'm willing to take that risk, but I will I need to understand what the ownership risk would be. I, I also will just comment, this is a different comment, that, that we are early in the battery <laughs> transition and we're gonna see changes in the next five years in these battery prices, like we've seen in solar in the last five years. There's gonna be change and there may be technology change which significantly impacts change here. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that. So I think it's good to explore the models and come up with what we see as a model. I don't think we have to think it's going to be scalable in the sense we experience today because it's going to change. And, and we want the model that will enable us to scale in the future. Okay. Risks aside, there is a tremendous potential benefit to at least having control of the batteries. And six megawatts of batteries is 1% of our people. 
and that could have a huge impact on our, our on our costs on a, you know on a bad day where we're under under contract at six percent it could save us millions of dollars yeah. in one swoop up so it's it's I mean I, yeah I agree that we have to play the percentage of risks but I think we've got to keep in mind that the benefits of at least having control of batteries for if nothing more than load management is, is potentially huge mm -hmm. I would be okay. So I was going to say there, there are ways of mitigating the risk. I mean, look, markets will mitigate any risk for you. Right? So, sure. What um, options are there out there that we could mitigate our risks, and what might be the cost, and we can weigh those. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, then the second question is around the round two capital. Uh, so we mentioned sixty million dollars for the solar portion and another eight or so uh, for batteries, and uh, perhaps directors can comment on you know our appetite to consider taking on on that capital or find third party avenues for uh, of sourcing that capital. Well, first of all, that assumes a hundred percent is they are able to stay in the that's program. that's true that would be Which you know is not true that's true there will be attrition for sure by the time agencies come to signing the final one but so even if it's at 50 percent which hopefully it won't be that then you'd be at approximately 30 right but, but what is our outlay of capital is it, I mean, it's, it's not $30 million of our capital because some of it is subsidized through the tax bill, right? It, uh, so, yes. Uh, however, the, there's a timing uh, issue there. So, uh, you know, 30% will come from ITC. We don't know how quickly that money will show up. So, it could be two to three years. Uh, we don't that's know. That's a cash flow issue. That's not a good answer. That, that, that is a cash flow issue. Um, um, the forecast, we had a five year plan that shows that this board is only approved one year, but the five year plan, we assume the bulk of those funds go out uh, in next year and the 2025 year, and the bulk of the ITC credit comes back in two years later, or the 30% credit comes back in two years later. So it is a cash flow issue. Well, the outflow for us at the, at the moment is assumed to be the whole 60 million. Um, and but I'll um, keep in mind, sit, sit, seal, um, <laughs> nobody yet has received this IPC credit to prove that it actually is going to come. So but we have assumed that we see the point of highlighting it. Well, the guidance is out. I mean, that's, the guidance is out. Yeah, and there's a reasonable expectation, right. but it would be three or four years before we would get it. And lots can happen in three or four years. And there are some details that have raised some questions about. Uh, about anyway specific amounts and so forth that are, that we have are still working with our tax council on. Well, I don't think I don't think anybody I don't think the board is going to want to shell out sixty million dollars even I mean, even given the recaptures of it. So it's a lot of huge chunk of our if, if in fact we had one hundred percent or it would use up the whole surplus funds yeah. amount. Yeah. Yes. That's true, but it is, as I said, it's already assumed in the numbers that the surplus funds committee has been assumed. Uh, no, the round 2A is, I think, 20 million. It's already in our budget, but not round 2 A. Oh. It's already in our budget. Yeah, it's not in our budget. Yeah, it's not in our budget. So uh, the RFP was written uh, with the intention of being flexible to allow us to get pricing, including third party capital. Pricing, particularly on the round 2B. So we will, once we have proposals in hand, we'll have more detail and we'll be able to come back to the executive committee with, with that detail and uh, get further direction. But this has been uh, extremely helpful. Okay, so I'd like to take public comment. We're almost at the end of the meeting. Um, I have a public comment from Dave. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Nagolia. Hey, um, I just, I got a couple questions. They shouldn't be too bad. Um, there was the webinar that was on last Tuesday and none of this was ever brought up. But now that there is a lot of uncertainty with the battery storage and what the liabilities are and the financing, is that going to, is that going to affect the timeline for this? Because uh, the way it states in the RFP is that 
you know, the contractor's got to commit a statement of interest by the 22nd, which is another 10 days from now, 10, 11 days. And then um, the proposals are due in about two or three weeks later. Do you think that what all the uncertainty that's going on under this conversation, is that going to affect your timeline? And the, the, uh, Dave, thank you. And by the way, thank you. I want to thank Dave Morrow for being incredibly helpful uh, throughout this, this process. And we, of course, are working with Intermountain Electric that's based in San Carlos and it's an IME, uh, excuse me, a, a, a IBW signatory. Um, and uh, so, the, the, Dave, the answer there is that the 2A and 2B groups are being dealt with separately. Um, so 2A is operating under the NEM2 timeline, uh, whereas the 2B group, which has the batteries, we anticipate is going to be a longer term uh, discussion and negotiation. Uh, and so we are looking for proposals, uh, but proposers can choose to propose on just 2A or right. on 2B or both. So okay, there's just a lot of flexibility in the RFP. Yeah, I just, I just wanted, to, I just wanted to double check because if I start getting calls from the contractors, I want to be able to answer them for them. The ex, my ex, my next question is really simple: is that have you gotten a lot of feedback from contractors interested up to this point? Uh, we have had quite a lot of participation in the workshop and a number of inquiries. We are anticipating good participation in the uh, in the RFP. Yes. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. To be the 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 agency participants in to be have their interconnection agreements filed, so they're yes. all qualified under them too. Yes, it turns out that the battery with the battery though, which is the only way to make those economic, uh, it doesn't really matter if they're in M2. The battery does have to be, but just the solar has to be. Interconnection for the solar has to have been filed. Oh, well, it was filed. Yeah, it was filed. Uh, but uh, but with the battery systems, actually, it makes the question kind of moot. Uh, so, so they can be an M3 and the economics are almost identical. Yeah, just to make this even more concrete, those projects will not move forward under NEM2, actually. We we will uh, file a separate interconnection agreement uh, or interconnect, interconnection application for solar and storage for those facilities um, under the net value billing tariff. I, I do want to just recognize Peter Levitt, um, who has, along with Raphael and the team, been running this and just doing phenomenal work. Uh, first of all, to get all of the applications across the goal line by that NEM2 deadline. The guy was working 24-7. Um, and, and then just sort of this further analysis, risk assessment. We have a whole team working behind him, consultants and others, but I do want to just say thank you, Peter, for all of your efforts. Thanks, Sean. This Thanks, is Sean. truly an innovative approach to deploying solar and storage, and I think it could be highly scalable. So I'm I'm really excited. Okay. That's the end of that discussion. We'll pick it up later. Yeah. Uh, are there any committee member reports? Okay, seeing none. Motion to adjourn is in order. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely.